Hi, She 2.0 listeners. This is Ramona. And I'm Jackie. How are you, Jack? I'm great. Especially <laughs> great after our chat tonight. There's hope, Ramona. There is hope. And I think our listeners are going to be really excited and kind of surprised that um, when they listen to this guest. So I don't know if anyone knew this because you and I didn't know this. I'm sure there's somebody <laughs> out there that knew this, but I'm wondering if any of our listeners knew that there's such thing as a certified menopause practitioner. That's kind of like a unicorn in our world, right? It, it feels like a unicorn. <laughs> it totally. is a unicorn. I had no idea. So Carolyn Wiskin, she's a pharmacist. She's a certified menopause practitioner. She's a motivational speaker, and she's from Brandt Arts IDA Pharmacy. And she joined us to talk to us about exactly what this certification is and that there's people out there like <laughs> her who help women like us. <laughs> and she's from my hometown, Burlington, Ontario. Woo, um, woo, woo. A uh, big shout out. Um, but it's great to know that, you know, when Carolyn t told us that, you know, a little bit about her history, when she started this, like over a decade ago, there was like 20 people in Canada doing this. And now the numbers are higher, but not high enough. So anyone looking for a career change, there you go. Absolutely. And um, she'll tell us all about it. And she's got some webinars coming up. Can you shout out those dates for us, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. So guys, um, there are these online webinars that are being hosted by Brand Arts and Carolyn will be um, co-leading them. Uh, they are April 29th, May 19th, and June 8th. Space is limited and there are some rules uh, to join the webinar. You have to be postmenopausal, not on HRT, and you can find all the list of information. Uh, these one-hour webinars are going to be a wealth of information to help you sort of develop a plan to get through your menopausal experience. So you can find the link in our post, but it is www.branterts.ca front slash menopause. And if you need to email them, you can email them at womenshelp at branterts.ca. Awesome. Well, I hope people check it out and have a listen to Carolyn Wiskin. Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really excited to have you. I'm excited to be here. Um, I have to be honest and say, I think we both fell off our chair when Jackie <laughs> and I discovered that there was something called a menopause practitioner or someone called a menopause practitioner. And I'd love for you to explain to us what exactly that is. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you that... Uh, Back in, I hate to date myself, but about 16 years ago, there was a study that had been done called the Women's Health Initiative. And many people were very uncertain about, should I stay on hormones? What should I take? How should I manage my menopause? And it was at that time that Carrie and I, uh, Carrie Roberts, uh, who are both pharmacists, having so many questions, felt we wanted to look for a credential, something that would validate knowledge in women's health where we would have the most up-to-date information and research and leaders in the field throughout the entire transition of a woman's hormonal change. And we looked to the North American Menopause Society, who had only two or three years prior, so this is now 16 years ago, had developed this credential, specifically for people who were practicing medical professionals who were doing a lot of work in guiding women through this transitional time. And it was that organization that came up with this credential. And the people who started to get it first were obstetricians and gynecologists who already are specialists in women's health. But it wasn't a designation that would talk about guiding women through all of the symptoms, right? A lot of, in terms of obstetrician gynecology, we're looking at examination of a woman from a surgical perspective, taking them through a pregnancy, but guiding them through their low libido, going into depth around joint pain being increased at that time, and so many other aspects. Um, it really was thought to be 
a significant designation that would ensure the upkeep of knowledge in that field. You would have to submit your learnings on a regular basis. You would write an exam um, that was very in-depth, have to indicate the number of hours you spent working in that field. And so when Carrie and I got this designation 16 years ago, there was only about 20 people in Canada who had received it. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> How many people? 20. So now, I mean, there, there's certainly a lot more over the years, but, um, you know, we were in the early stages of that. And uh, it was really lovely that when I went to write this exam and basically gave practitioners in the area the reason for it and that we wanted to have knowledge that was current, up to date and be able to provide the best guidance for women. We had family physicians who were thanking us and saying, oh my gosh, we need this type of up to date knowledge we will refer to that service because honestly, in the appointment time that we have, we just can't go through all those details that are questions for women. So um, I think it's been very rewarding. And certainly I feel that that ongoing knowledge has been uh, transmitted to so many women who have found just knowledge is power, right? And I think you doing this um, podcast on a regular basis are empowering women by sharing this great knowledge. So definitely uh, that was what drove us. Oh, that's great to hear. I, I, I think um, by the look on Ramona's face, we're both a little astounded right now because um, we've both gone through some gaps in the healthcare system about our own health during menopause. And Ramona is a two-time breast cancer survivor, and I went through early menopause. We've never been offered um, anything to tell us that there's a practitioner out there like you who could help us with this. Like, I I didn't even shocked. know this existed. I am shocked. And the fact that this organization existed 16 years ago, because we get a lot of messages from women that are part of our community now that have thanked us and said, where were you like 10 years ago? I needed to know this stuff 10 years ago. I'm so grateful that you guys are doing this and we're doing it because we felt like there is this gap of information. You know, I'd be curious to know how many members are there because I do feel like a lot of health practitioners are ill-equipped and don't have the information they need to support us. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you think about a general practitioner, a physician who is managing every aspect of health, so they are the quarterback on your team mm -hmm. and they have to be able to diagnose and recommend treatments for things from epilepsy to diabetes, you know, to looking after your athlete's foot <laughs> to the common cold, you yeah. name it, expand so many things. So to be able to have someone who takes a focused area, attends the national and international meetings in that field is reading journals, just there's a menopause medical journal, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's no way in a day that all practitioners could read right. at that level in every single disease state which is why you end up having specialists. So when we first became menopause practitioners, of course, being local in Burlington, we put out many um, pieces of information, whether it be in the post or people interviewed us. Um, we sent out a notification to every family doctor in the area to let them know that we were doing this and you know what our, our certification was. We offered to go and visit those offices and share the knowledge we had learned and how we would do an appointment with a woman and the kind of intake um, that would we'd come with that because there is about an eight page questionnaire that was developed by the North American Menopause Society that we use as an intake. So we wanted everyone to be you know, very transparent in terms of what we could offer, the report we would send back to the physician because this is a collaborative situation. We're not right. giving a prescription. We are developing a treatment plan with the woman who we're seeing and then we're presenting that back to the doctor for their endorsement because if there's a prescription needed not always is there they would be the one prescribing it right. so we want it to be very collaborative um, and then to your point because you know I often think that the learner doesn't always appear right away the information could be there but you as somebody to share it doesn't appear until the learner is ready you know what I'm saying you're not looking for something yeah. you don't need yeah. yet that's and right. so even though we've been out there for a while, the way we started was through doing public seminars where Carrie and I would donate our time for a cause. So at Central High School in Burlington, right beside the pharmacy, they were doing fundraisers to help support school activities. And a lot of the, the women having teenage children were starting to go through those transitional times. And so we offered, hey, if you want to do a women's sort of a women's health day, we'll come, we'll speak, we'll share our knowledge, like no charge. And then you 
you can you know, do what you want with the day. And we had 300 women that would attend that session, well beyond oh just God. women who were parents. And we did it year after year. And they had, you know, different vendors come in and draws and lunch. And it was a whole afternoon event. Um, we've done it for breast cancer um, in terms of a fundraiser. We had done a couple of sessions there, one up actually in Waterdown at, at the Catholic, one of the Catholic churches there. Uh, we did it for C cadets. And then we put out to anyone we could get their email. We will do little seminars for you and your friends. Uh, we had groups of women who invited us to say that the private room at a restaurant, we didn't charge them just to come and share good information and ask questions. So we've been doing that over this entire time, trying to spread the word. So it's sort of disheartening to think that, you know, there's still so many people who don't know that this exists because there's just not a lot of us. You know, yeah. and, and you're not looking for things you don't, you're not gonna Google menopause practitioner because you don't even know there is one. Don't we would never have Googled that. You're a no. unicorn. Yeah. But I guess this is, I guess my question is like why I, I actually can appreciate and I'm glad that you mentioned that obviously your GP can't, can't be the expert on everything. And I think sometimes we forget that, right? We're expecting more. And, and so I'm grateful that you pointed that out, but I am curious do they not know that you exist? Because I don't expect my GP to maybe have the in-depth knowledge that you do with your certification, but it would have been nice to know that you exist, that one mm -hmm. of you exists out there that would be able to provide me with that knowledge. Because I think a lot of our listeners sometimes feel that they go to their GP and they start like talking about these changes that are happening in their bodies. And sometimes they don't even know that they're menopause related and so it's like, where, how do women find that support if their GP isn't quite aware that their menopausal changes, mm -hmm. maybe not, um, if they're not that um, knowledgeable in the area, but also a lot of women feel dismissed, like, oh, it's menopause, like deal with it yeah. um, without getting that extra support. Yeah, th it, it, this is a challenge. As, as I mentioned, half the women we see are coming through referrals through their family doctor. So we know that there is a group of family physicians who have referred many women, have been really pleased with the, the report we send back, the women's response and their understanding, because these sessions are uh, usually an hour, but sometimes I'm a bit chatty, as you can tell, so they often will go over, but anyway, <laughs> but usually an hour. And uh, so to have that amount of time to not just learn about yourself, what's normal, what can be done from a natural perspective, lifestyle perspective, prescription options. What are all the things that are available to me to address all these concerns and truly understanding what concerns may even be related to hormonal change. So yeah. when they do the questionnaire and page seven actually of that questionnaire is a list of symptoms that can be related to hormonal change. And people are just shocked when they look at that to see how many of those symptoms they have that they would have never related specifically things around mood, anxiety, even difficulty with sleep without night sweats, waking them, sleep quality declines when estrogen falls. So a lot of that is just unknown information. So to think of all the people I see, half of them are referred from family doctors, but most of it is word of mouth through somebody who has heard about us, something you know they may have seen, um, whether it be you know, in the past, we were doing some of these seminars publicly and now, that sort of opportunity it has gone to us just doing some virtual sessions, but it is a difficult thing. I, I mean, maybe we need to have more hashtags. Yes. <laughs> just menopause practitioner. Uh, you know, maybe we need to be under hashtag hot flashes and you look that up and a menopause practitioner pops up, but yeah. uh, you know, your, your points well taken that perhaps how we're trying to reach people, but here's another piece. Family physicians aren't always referring to things that aren't OHIP covered. Because they're very conscious that if I say, oh, you know what, it could be really helpful for you to say visit a chiropractor for this or to go whatever. If you don't have a private plan that covers these other um, health services beyond what's under OHIP, then it can make a person feel bad that here's a resource, but it's only for those who could afford it. Yeah. And it's very unfortunate that our one-on-one -on -one consults, although are very valuable, are a tax deductible expense because as pharmacists, our consultations have been deemed that through um, the government. So you get a receipt, you can use it for income tax. Many people have health spending accounts. 
they have submitted it to their private plan. But unfortunately, it's not something under OHIP. So I, I think that could be mm. part of it too, you know? That's that a really is. good point. But isn't that disappointing to hear that something that all women will go through is not covered by OHIP? Mm -hmm. Like, do you see that changing ever? Well, let's just say you're an obstetrician gynecologist and you have this designation and you could go to that person for this kind of consult. The problem is there's not enough hours in the day. The people who have uh, you know, questionable lesions, who may have a cancerous issue, they're gonna be seen way ahead of somebody who's complaining of hot flashes. And to give that person an hour is probably not gonna be OHIP billable. So when you think about how OHIP allows physicians to bill, it's based on blocks of time. So somebody coming in and you can only bill for one specific complaint on a given day. Yeah. So if you have a lady in complaining of hot flashes, if she goes on to talk about her low libido and her joint pain and whatever, you have to come back for that complaint. You have to come back for that complaint. So the doctor can actually probably only bill for a 15 minute visit on that given day. And this is another reason why um, I think that it becomes a bit fragmented and all those pieces don't get put together. So mm -hmm. I, you know, the, the system right now is not conducive to these long consultations. And do I see OHIP funding changing for more in-depth um, meetings and longer uh, you know, appointments? I don't know that that's gonna happen in our current climate with all of the expense our healthcare system yeah. has had of late. Right. Um, you know, unfortunately. And so this is where being able to share good information in public forums and like what you have going right here with this podcast is a great way to at least give women enough knowledge that they can ask those intelligent questions and, right. and get answers and understand, you know, what is safe, what isn't, what is normal, what isn't. And I think, you know, uh, the more that we can offer good information for people to knowledge is power, um, mm -hmm. to be able to act on the better. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Can I ask you, um, where did you go for your training? Like what schools are offering or, or what institutions are offering this training for a menopause practitioner or designation? Well, really, it's, I wouldn't say it's schooling per se. So anyone who wants to become a certified menopause practitioner has to be a licensed, regulated health professional first. Okay. So all of anyone in that, whether it's a, a nurse, so there's some nurse practitioners doing this, um, certainly there's some pharmacists, but by and large, obstetricians and gynecologists and some family physicians, but that group is much larger than, say, those that are pharmacists. So first of all, in order to even write the exam, you have to do that. Now, the exam is, you know, several hours. It's quite in depth. But what they're really looking for <coughs> is that ongoing expertise in learning and submitting all your learning hours by attending meetings, by doing readings, by doing um, you know quizzes that tie in with those readings. And so it's not so, they do have a course that is available at the North American Menopause Society annual conferences. So they would often have a pre-meeting where they would have a course for those preparing to write the exam. But the biggest thing was a clinical practice guideline book, which was a large, you know, voluminous kind of, of, of uh, reading, several, several chapters that outlined, and it, it was updated regularly. So it wasn't so much you were taking a full-on course, it was more that the amount you would have to do to prepare to be successful in this exam would be driven by all of the learnings that they provided, um, and also the understanding of this clinical guide, which is updated regularly. And then the fact that once you get that certification, that you have to maintain that, um, you can't hold it indefinitely, you have to continue to submit your learnings. So that's more how it goes. Right, okay. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, on a system that's otherwise taxed most of the time and a doctor or a pharmacist that already has a ton to do, I wonder sometimes if, it, if it's a priority for them to get this extra certification, like, you know, unless you're really heavily invested in this space, right? Right. That's right. There's so many things. I mean, when you think about, there's people who become certified diabetes educators, right? as an example. They're not necessarily going to school for it. It's all about 
if you pass that exam, that means your knowledge is so in depth. And so yes, there's little side courses you can take, there's tons of reading and preparatory material, and then you have to maintain that credential through ongoing learning. But there's many of these certifications for health professionals to, to achieve if they really wanna delve into the specialty, because there's no point in going to that trouble and then not spending significant amount of time in the field to practice the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something that you really feel you're gonna spend a lot of time with. Right, yeah, that right. makes sense. I'm just, um, like, I think it's great that you're doing this, but I have a question, like, in your own personal career path, what made you decide to really hone in on this? Well, I really think, it, you know, it was a pivotal point. Um, as I mentioned, this WHI, this Women's Health Initiative, had been released, and we're going back now, uh, getting closer to 20 years, but it was more than 16 years ago, because that's when we went to get this credential. But I will just say, at that time, I am a woman myself, right? I'm going to be, I wasn't at that point yet, but I'm going to be going through those changes. And I could not really, when someone asked me and I'm dispensing a prescription and it's for a hormone therapy and we've got a study that's just being released that is telling women that it can increase heart attacks and strokes after four years of being on it. How can I now dispense this, take a new medication in, give good information to patients who are asking, physicians are asking, I just felt that it was such a void in true understanding of what was appropriate or not. Suzanne Summers was on, you know, the, the, yeah. on the TV, um, writing books. She was promoting, you know, certain natural options and compounded options. And you know, we have compounded options today, but they are options that are, are given in the context of looking at the true risks and benefits of all things, not to say one thing is safe without any evidence of it. So we are in a position that we have got great, um, information that we can share. So it was really about, I had passion to my do my best job and I didn't feel I was armed to do it. And that's what drove me to learn more. Right. Okay. So you that's said amazing. compound, compound. So when we talk about compounding, it's making a prescription for um, uh, any person where there isn't a commercially available product that would meet that need. So let's just say you have an allergy to corn. Well, corn and its derivatives are in just about every capsule or tablet. So you can even buy acetaminophen over the counter if you're allergic, you're allergic to corn. It would have to be compounded in a way that we'd make that capsule from scratch without any filler that would be an issue for you. Um, let's just say for religious reasons, you don't wanna take a capsule that is a gelatin based because that's from an animal. Right. So you want a cellulose or veggie cap. Well, that doesn't come with every product. So maybe we have to make that. Or you have a lactose allergy, right? And the prescription you're on needs to be compounded. It could be a pediatric prescription where what's commercially available are tablets for adults for heart disease. But here you have an infant with a heart condition and there is no commercially available liquid for that child. That has to be compounded. So mm -hmm. this idea of compounding is really to meet individual need. And um, we have people who were using progesterone and it had a peanut base. So if somebody needs pro progesterone as a capsule right. to balance the estrogen they're on, how are they gonna get that and safely take that product? Well, it has to be made from scratch in a base that doesn't use peanuts. So there's people who would use a topical estrogen and perhaps get a rash from that gel, right? Or it not absorb well, or an irritation from a patch. We right. wanna use something topical. So then, yes, we have creams that we can prepare that, that estrogen combination in. So it's the idea of, of having options, not to say estrogen is, is, is estrogen in a sense that I, if I wouldn't give a compounded estrogen cream to a woman, I wouldn't give a, an estrogen gel that's commercially available. Um, if you're not a candidate for it, you're not a candidate for it. And so I think uh, physicians really respected the fact that uh, as menopause practitioners, we have a great understanding of all the options where something compounded could actually be the best option for that woman, whereas something commercially available might be the best option for someone else. Mm -hmm. And where does all that fit? And, and really looking at the science behind it. And so um, I think that, you know, we have grown with knowledge over time. And even women who have come to see us um, looking at what are all these options from the person who has uh, had breast cancer and, and what can I use to control my symptoms that's not hormonal and, and what is safe and what do those things look like and what has evidence and how much mm -hmm. do I use? 
Well, all those things, just, you know, someone buying black cohosh, for instance, it's the root of the plant. You know, it, it's the strength of it. It's not every product is created equal. And um, when we go to conferences, we're really privy to international experts from looking at soy to black cohosh to things for um, vaginal dryness to libido to the best thing for hot flashes. For women who have all different backgrounds in terms of their medical history, what fits? And uh, mm. that knowledge has just been so rewarding to be able to share. Okay, so I have another question about you know, what it, the information that you give and the expertise that you offer, um, because you are tied to a pharmacy, mm -hmm. um, do you only offer pharmaceutical options when you are talking to women in this space, or do you also look at like, um, natural alternatives? Like, how does that work for you? Well, absolutely. Just like I was talking black cohosh, mm -hmm. all of that's, uh, that's an herbal product. So there's many people who come in and basically what we're doing is giving them a treatment plan. So uh, even when we do seminars, we spend a significant amount of time looking at all the non-hormonal, non-prescription options. So lifestyle, deep paced breathing, looking at adrenal function, looking at levels of stress. Um, I'll spend a lot of time talking to someone about connecting with people who make you feel good. Um, how much time are you spending outdoors? What have you given up? given that women tend to be that caregiver for all, whether it's children mm -hmm. or yes. our parents, what are you doing for you? And we know, and it's been well studied, that working with your hands and creating things is a major way that we nourish our adrenal glands. And you think in menopause, where are your hormones coming from? Is basically your adrenal glands when your ovaries are producing, um, certainly not estrogen and progesterone, but declining levels of testosterone too. So how do we keep that adrenal gland nourished? Because it is our only real hormone factory moving forward. What are we doing about that from what are the supplements that nourish the gland? What type of B vitamin? What type of omega-3? Um, so uh, honest to goodness, the prescription portion is actually the smallest portion of the consult. It, it's, okay. And the plan is the person's plan, whether they choose to, to purchase one thing, because yes, we're affiliated with the pharmacy, um, the plan is theirs to, to execute however they wish. That's great well, That's news. really reassuring. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, has there been any surprises for you being in this role um, with just the new clients that you may see, like their, I guess their response to you, their initial reactions to having somebody be able to support them in this way? You know, I, I have to say when I've spoken to someone and they've maybe, I've seen them a couple of days later for whatever reason, um, you know, walking in the pharmacy, some of these people who come to us are people who have been to the pharmacy for years. And even though we've been doing this <laughs> again, didn't even realize it until the need arose for themselves. But the biggest thing I have to tell you is and it was honestly the most i think one of the most rewarding moments in doing this is i saw someone who was in complete despair um and we have many women because often you don't seek help when things are going great right? right right so it's at a time when a lot of the emotional aspects of hormonal change can have huge impact on the way people see themselves and how they interact with their friends and with their loved ones Mm -hmm. And, you know, lack of patience, lack of tolerance, not liking the way they respond to things and feeling that they've lost some control and, and really feeling their relationships are affected <laughs> and not understanding how much of that was, you know, not them just being mean, of course, uh, but tr truly that it was hormonal change and that there was an opportunity and a great opportunity to change that completely gave women a sense of hope. Mm -hmm. So when I see a woman in despair, and often, I mean, I have a box of Kleenex in the office because it gets used. Uh, people have just been to their wits end with, with the changes and not knowing how to manage them. And now to put some sense of normalcy to these things are when a person has of hormones were recommended, we haven't even filled a prescription. We've written a letter to the doctor. Of course, that's up to them where they get it filled, but they haven't even got it yet, okay? And they come in looking and sounding like a different person. And uh, what, have, what did you do in the last few yeah. days? You look, you look fabulous, like your, your demeanor. She said, well, I have hope. Yeah, and I think it's that acknowledgement and of, 
you know, oh my God, like I'm, I'm not going crazy. Cause I know we've heard from quite a few listeners ourselves where, you know, the idea of this too is to, to mitigate some of those symptoms of perimenopause before we hit menopause and what can we do? And a lot mm-hmm. of women are experiencing perimenopause and have no idea that that's what's happening to them. So mm-hmm. when we're talking about increased anxiety or lack of sleep or, you know, hormonal changes, um, like mental clarity, all of those things are affected. And like you said, they affect our, our personal feelings, like about ourselves, maybe sometimes the way that we perform at our jobs or with our families or whatever. And these, and women are suffering because they actually have no idea that this is what's happening to them. So I can imagine after having an appointment with you, how much lighter they must feel to just have the validation of like these things that are happening to you are, are actually happening. And yeah, it's not in your head. Yeah. And it's not something one little vitamin D tablet is going to change for you. Like there are things you have to do. You have to do the work. And it's, it's one of those things where one change can be that positive cycle of many great changes. So when you're really feeling down about the symptoms that you're experiencing, you're maybe not sleeping as well, you're finding changes in your, your disposition in terms of your mood, maybe your joints are feeling stiffer. There's so many things that are happening. You're not feeling as good about yourself. Well, at those times, isn't it easier to grab that snack food, right? Uh, isn't it easier? People have talked about the, the COVID-19 <laughs> as in <Yeah>. pounds. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so when we think about how we try and make ourselves feel better with some people that's food and then you know you didn't sleep well you're tired so isn't it easier to to just pick up that fast food item and not take the time to have made that item from scratch and now you're feeling tired you're eating more sugar whatever so you didn't sleep well so it's hard to push yourself to do that exercise Mm. so you just find that all the things that could have been helping you you're almost feeling disabled to do Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. you're in this negative zone and you sort of get to the point, well, will it make a difference? You know, I'm feeling a bit down on myself and everything around you seems to be on a negative trend. And then you just have that one positive step. You know, what is one change that you can make? Even though you you give a list of things that could to uh, elevate, what's one thing that could really just spiral you into all the positives. And and that's what it is. It's just starting to change that sense of who you can be and what your future is can be great. And I think women need to realize that at this time of change, which I mean, perimenopause could start in your late 30s, right? It doesn't have to all be late 40s and into 50s. So during this whole transitional time, you know, is when women have probably and the most outstanding value in terms of in the business world, um, in, if they're entrepreneurs, in, in their family life, no matter what, they have gained such experience, they have such knowledge, and we are at a time where we are can be such amazing contributors. And yes. it's sad that people feel um, stifled by these symptoms that could be managed because it could be an amazing time in their life. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a time when, you know, you like most of us, well, not all of us, Ramona and I have young kids at home, but typically your kids are a little bit older and more independent. You know, you're in that uh, more senior position in your work or you're, you're just somewhere in your life where you are finally getting that independence back. This is when you should really be flourishing and enjoying. And it's a really good thing that you said, Carolyn, like I I found myself going through some anxiety and depression with my menopause. And when that happens, my husband will attest to this. You take, I take everything personally. I view things from a very cynical lens. Um, It's hard to be positive. And like you said, I have a hard time working out. I'm just tired. And so I'm not a, like I don't eat sweets during the day, but I just, I don't eat great during the day. Like I don't do anything for myself to, to create energy. So I'm on a computer all day and then I'm on it all night. And Ramona is the same. And, and especially with COVID, we're all kind of in that position, but we feel that's a cumulative, cumul, hate that word, cumulative effect where we, um, we just keep going down that path and we keep feeling more tired, more down. And like you said, I think women need to feel hope. You need to change something. You've got to switch something 
to get that energy back, to do one little thing that will make a big mm -hmm. change down the road, right? Yeah. So I, I love that you're saying that because I think that's the hope that we all need to hear. It's, you know, many of us feel like there's this sort of attitude out there that menopause is what it is. And that's very deceptive, but it's also very discouraging. Mm -hmm. As if this is it, well, this sucks. But knowing that we have control of the situation, and this is what Ramona and I talk about so often, knowing that in perimenopause, we can take control so that the entire rest of the runway doesn't suck. That's right. And perimenopause is often fraught with more symptoms, I mean, than menopause itself. But we do know the two years before a, a woman's final period and the two years after are the time that is fraught with the most emotional a difficulty in perimenopause because the up and down of month to month not knowing where that hormone balance will be and then in menopause of course the hormone levels have plummeted and are low all the time but those changes um, are very hard for some women more than others and everyone is different but one of the things that we know you know eventually will happen is if anyone in a relationship over time and as we age we know libido is going to fall we know there's less blood flow to that area we know there's dryness um, they've done mri uh, tests of women in their 20s and 30s and they would lay in the mri and watch sexual films if you can believe it and then they would do the same with women who were in their you know early 40s to early 50s zone and the reactions in terms of chemicals made in the brain blood flow to the general area night and day watching mm -hmm. the same fills, films uh, analyzed so you know here's a situation where you can actually give validity to women that this is an anatomical change in the way we respond to things doesn't mean we can't do anything about it doesn't mean that at all but it, it's again an appreciation that something that you were so afraid to maybe discuss and that isn't commonly asked so you know there's another thing when you talk about going to the family doctor and your annual physical you know, it's not always on that tick box to ask, how are things going in terms of libido? How, mm -hmm. how is, you know, yep. how are your relationship, um, how's your relationship? Because maybe if there's not a quick answer to it, maybe they don't want that answer <laughs> right yeah, now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just giving you one example, but it's good to have the science to, to offer that validity that makes someone realize, hey, it's not me. It's not, there's anything wrong with my partner, but to be able to come and share that and say, look, mm -hmm. I, there's stuff that can be done, but this is an anatomical change with time. Like this is not something that's wrong with me or wrong with a partner. Um, it doesn't mean you don't love the person. Uh, but I mean, I'm just mentioning it because of all the things that come up, whether there's hot flashes, night sweats, I have to say that that's one of uh, the larger concerns of women throughout the entire transitional time. What's oh, your relationship? Absolutely. And I, I have heard, and I think we both heard that this is also when the divorce rate becomes an mm -hmm. issue, right? Because yes. you, can't, you don't have the emotional fortitude to keep having those battles or work them out, right? Like you just feel so worn down or negative or you see things through a completely different lens than I think you do when you're feeling at your best. Mm -hmm. So Carolyn, you've got this really great webinar coming up and we'd love to know a little bit about it. And, um, and if you could also tell us like who qualifies for it, because it sounds very interesting. Mm -hmm. So we've done many webinar, webinars, as I mentioned, um, if, if women had wanted sort of a group session, we have offered that, we've offered live sessions. This is over a large period of time and certainly the virtual more so in the last year. But this, this a webinar offering of which we've got um, three dates coming up, April, May, June, and we just did one, is actually a study of evaluating a menopause practitioner as a pharmacist, what are... Um, educational impact is and so we've done all this teaching we've done all these you know, sessions as I mentioned over time but we didn't evaluate what was a woman's understanding of her own condition and I say condition but of her own hormonal status and what those changes may mean did a woman understand what options were available to her and if hormones were even a consideration, was it something that generated a lot of fear to even think about that as an option? So we really wanted to understand where women were once they became menopausal. Because when you're doing an evaluation or study, you sort of want to limit it to a certain group because you're going to have more value in your results if you have more of a common denominator amongst the people who are attending. So it's not that we don't see all people and do sessions for many, but this particular thing we're looking at now was something that we applied um, for a grant 
to actually analyze and be able to publish and share at conferences and so on, what impact good knowledge has on what people end up doing. Do they end up seeking the help of their family doctor as a result of that knowledge? Do they end up purchasing something over the counter? Do they end up changing their exercise pattern? Do they do anything different with it? And how is their confidence in understanding the information, but also in and what treatments are available. So the idea is we would do a questionnaire in advance, um, right before, the session is about a two and a half hour webinar, trying to keep the numbers down to about 25 so that people have the opportunity to ask questions and so on. And then we do a follow-up questionnaire immediately after to see what is a person's change in their perception of the, of the initial questions. And then a follow-up is done a few months later to say, what did you actually do with that information? Did you end up making any changes, following up with any healthcare provider? And, um, and that's, we thought was a really good project to do, to see are we giving information that actually makes change for people. And of course, there's no charge to participate in this. Um, it's just an opportunity for learning as long as you're willing to, to answer these, these surveys that will provide us with some knowledge. So in, in defining who that group might be, it was thought that it would be menopausal women in the first five years, so the first five years since their last period, whether that was surgically induced or happened naturally, and someone who's not currently on hormone therapy. Somebody could have picked right. one over the counter product, but we really want to know that person who's in that first five years when the symptoms tend to be the greatest, who is now looking for some answers or solutions, who could mm -hmm. really benefit from this kind of knowledge. Right. And so those are virtual seminars, webinars that you're offering. What can women walk away from? Well, I think first of all, they're going to do a survey to analyze some of their own symptoms. And okay. we do share that back, not obviously it's anonymous when they do that, but what we're trying to do is get a sense of the people attending, what, what is driving you to come here? What yeah. are some of the symptoms you have? So right off the bat, a woman is learning, even through doing that survey for the attendants, what maybe some symptoms are that they didn't even realize were affiliated. Yeah. Then when we go through that, uh, that seminar, we're gonna start right back with what we understand of the body, how hormones are made during our regular cyclic thing years, what happens as our ovaries, the eggs inside these little fluid filled sacs we call follicles, what happens as they age over time? What is, what are those sort of perimenopausal symptoms moving into menopause? And then taking each of those areas and looking at how we can address that from a natural perspective, whether it's lifestyle, how we address that if we wanted to look more at an herbal perspective and where hormone therapy may fit across any of those types of situations. So afterwards, I think it leaves people with a knowledge of what options there are for them um, based on the symptoms that they have. And they've evaluated and, and sort of learned something about themselves along the way. So the response that we've had for people who attended our first session was, was outstanding in terms of you know, gratitude for the learnings that they had and, and some self-reflection. That's amazing. So we're going to share information uh, in our post uh, about the upcoming webinars and uh, information that you need to know if you qualify for the webinar. I'm sure that there's a lot of women who are dying to attend this. Um, and we'll, yeah, like I said, we'll put it in the post with the registration information and, uh, and more information links to yourself and the webinar itself. This has been a pretty incredible chat. Like I think, <laughs> I don't know about you, Ramona, but there were like quite a few things in here where I thought, hmm, I did not know that. Not that I think I know everything. It's like, <laughs> that's why we're talking to you. But I feel like a lot of uh, listeners are going to listen to you, Carolyn, and think, wow, I need you. I need you and my team. I need you to get Yeah, I think it's really beneficial, you know, for Jackie and I, too, to follow up and look into the North, North American Menopause Society and whatever, um, you know, options are available to women depending on where you live in Canada. I think that would be really helpful. So mm. I didn't even know the North American Menopause Society existed. So again. Yeah. yeah. So anyone who's um, a certified practitioner with NAMS um, is listed on that site. So anyone who's Great. kept their credential active and it does indicate where they reside. So you can, anyone from across the country can, can look at that and, and see who those people are. So that's helpful. 
for sure. That's super helpful. Yeah, it's another step. And there's lots of learning resources that they have on their website as well. The Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, um, they don't have this type of, of certification, but many of the people who are members of that are members of the North American Menopause Society. So you don't have to be a credentialed menopause practitioner to attend the conferences and to actually pay a membership to NAMS. You can just do that because you want to have those meetings, but you didn't want to go through all the studies and and you know invest in paying to write exams and get this credential and 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 keep giving your you know um, ongoing learnings to them to maintain that some people just want to go to it for a conference maybe they attend that one year another year they attend a cardiology meeting or whatever it may be right. so uh, you know there's certainly a lot of people who would attend the meeting but they're not all certified right. and uh, yeah there's some great resources there there's also an international menopause society and they have, um, they're sort of a parent company, a parent company, a parent organization, if you will, to the North American one. And we, Carrie and I had the pleasure of attending the International Menopause Society meeting that was held about three years ago now, I'm thinking, in Vancouver. Um, and we have also a Canadian menopause group called SIGMA. That is their acronym. And those members are by and large all part of the North American group. But every two to three years, there is a Canadian uh, meeting, so we don't always have to go to the one in the states, but the same people tend to be attending all of these things, and they're really leaders in research and women's health from around the world. Uh, so it's an absolute pleasure to be able to learn from these experts. That was a fascinating conversation, and we would love to have you back. I'd love to come back.